Hello and greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, the home of the Peabody Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Abra Bush and I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Institute Studies at Peabody. I'm absolutely delighted that you could join us today for Instructional Design Basics, Migrating an In-Person Course to a Remote Course, the third in our series of nine summer lunch and learn events focused on the challenges and opportunities of remote instruction for music. A special thanks goes to the academic leadership at many of the conservatories and schools of music in the United States and the United Kingdom for their support for this series. They graciously supported my idea and recommended a list of presenters who, who do excellent work in the area of remote and online pedagogy. Before we get started, I'd like to thank a few Peabody staff members who are joining us and supporting this event today. Adam Scalici from Peabody's production team will be in the background monitoring the webinar and working through any technical challenges we may have. Please send comments directly to Adam in the chat if you have any problems or concerns. Patrick Wallen from the Dean's Office and Zane Forshi from Peabody's Launchpad will provide additional support. And Christina Mancior, also from Peabody's Launchpad, is here to help me curate your questions as we go through this process. A very, very special thank you to the entire team. A few quick notes before we begin. Please hop into the chat and introduce yourselves. We would love to hear from you and hope that you'll consider this an interactive session. Be sure to send your introduction to all panelists and attendees, not just the panelists. We hope that you'll consider this an interactive session. The presenters will spend about half an hour, after which we'll reserve the remainder of the time for your questions and comments. Please place those questions into the Q&A area of the webinar. We'll do our best to curate those questions and ask them of the presenters. Should you have any technical difficulties again, Adam's your guy. The presenters have agreed to allow us to record this webinar. The session will be posted to the Peabody website within one to two business days, should you wish to refer to it again or share it. And now I'm very pleased to welcome our two presenters for today. Joe Montcalmo is Peabody's Director of Academic Technology and Instructional Design, and Valerie Hartman is an instructional designer also with the Peabody Institute. Their full biographies may be found on the Peabody Keep Teaching website. Joe and Valerie, take it away. Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar today. We're really excited to be representing Peabody. Uh, I'm thrilled to be giving this presentation with our outstanding instructional designer, Valerie Hartman. Um, I'm gonna start, and then uh, when we get into the, the, some of the meat of the presentation, I'm gonna hand it over to Valerie, and then we're gonna go back and forth. So I hope you enjoy what we have to offer today. I'd like to thank uh, Abra for putting the webinar series together and for realizing that an instructional design basics webinar was something that belonged in the series. I know we've heard from a lot of our colleagues in various institutions about varying levels of instructional design support. Um, and uh, within Peabody, we certainly have had a strong response to our offerings, in the, especially in the last few months. Looking at the numbers in the webinar today, it's obvious that this was a, a good webinar to put on. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be doing it um, and to be providing all this information for all of you. So today we're gonna to be talking about instructional design basics and what it takes to get from teaching in person to teaching online. Most of the webinars in the summer series um, are music focused. So uh, this one is a more teaching and learning focused. We're trying to give you the foundations that you need to build upon with any of the specific teaching and learning that you need to do, do in your content areas. Um, with the foundational knowledge, you'll be able to branch off um, and you'll be able to pick tips and tricks from throughout the presentation that you would be most comfortable with implementing at first and then build on those uh, as you go along. Um, on every slide with every tip, we have deeper dive articles. We also have a supporting website that complements everything that we do today. And we're gonna share that with you a little bit later on in the presentation. So don't feel like you have to take notes. We've got everything put down for you. We've got everything in different formats. So regardless of what your favorite format is for learning, we've, we've, we've prepared for that. Um, and anything that we don't cover that might be more music focused or just uh, deeper questions about some of the tips that we do deliver, we're happy to address those in the Q&A after the presentation. So in terms of what we're gonna, how we're gonna talk about this today, uh, you know, in order to talk about what's next and how you can get there, we need to start with how we got here. 
Um, so we're going to talk about how we got to this moment, what's next, and how we might approach what's next, and specifically how you can get there. So that's what all these tips are. This is going to be like a fire hose, right? So what instructional design professionals over the last few months and many of you have been experiencing is just this onslaught of articles about how to teach online, how to teach music online. And it's very difficult sometimes to discern which articles are valuable and which aren't and which will work for you and which won't. Um, so an important thing to keep in mind throughout this presentation is um, just take notes on the things that you think you might want to implement first and you can always come back later and implement more things. We like to say pick one or two things and try them, see if they work. And then later on you can build on them or you can swap them out for other approaches that you think might be more valuable for you. Um, most importantly, uh, we're gonna present all of these tips and tricks through the lens of one of the most popular instructional design processes. It's called the ADDIE model. And I'll, I'll get, get into a little bit of what that stands for uh, as we get closer to the tips. Um, but we think it's important to give you an introduction not only to tips and tricks, but to organize them in a way that is based on sound principles um, and is very uh, simple to adopt. So how do we get here? Um, the spring was interesting for all of us, wasn't it? And it continues to be interesting as we move into the, the fall semester and even the spring of next year. So a big part of the success that we had at Peabody and I know that we had across higher ed and other teaching institutions was just the resiliency of our faculty. Um, you know, none of the faculty no faculty across the US or the world asked to teach online in the spring, certainly not in su with such a quick turnaround. Um, but yet we had so many student experiences that were positive, And that is largely due to what faculty were able to come up with um, many without the support structures in place that, that would have made it a little bit easier. Students were flexible. They were understanding of the situation. Now, I think that's going to change a little bit in the fall. They're going to know that faculty and institutions had a few months now to get used to this new environment um, and to realize that they were going to have to be flexible as we get towards um, whatever happens in the fall and the spring semester. Many of our faculty and many other faculty realized that if you just learn one or two tools that are part of the technology infrastructure at their institutions, they were able to function. Um, and that's not a bad thing. So as we go through this, we're not suggesting that you adopt technology because it's there, right? We're suggesting that you adopt one or two things. Um, our faculty uh, were able to adopt the learning management system and video conferencing system. And that was enough to have some really good experiences in the spring semester. And that may be enough going forward. So it's really important to remember to only apply some of these academic technologies when they serve the teaching and learning and the students that you're trying to get to. Again, in the spring, it was an emergency response situation. We're still kind of an emergency response, but now we can be a little bit more thoughtful. And I'll get to that in a second. And whether you knew it or not, in the spring semester, when all of this stuff hit the fan, um, you were applying learning uh, remote teaching methodologies and processes, whether you knew it or not. You were iterating, right? So you were trying things. Things were not working. You were getting frustrated. Things were working. You were getting excited. That's all part of the process. That's what we do every day. So. Uh, one of the overarching pieces of advice that we have for you is try to embrace that frustration. Try not to abandon things that you're trying because they're frustrating. Sometimes it takes a minute to figure this stuff out. And so patience is really important um, and attention to yourself and your students. You can see on this slide, uh, this isn't the first time that we've had an emergency situation where we had to teach remotely. 100, almost exactly 100 years ago, uh, the Spanish flu uh, this is an article from 1919 about how uh, student, high school students in California were, teach, were learning by telephone with their teachers uh, in the midst of the Spanish flu. So if you ever needed a little bit of proof that history repeats itself, there's some of it. So what's next? Um, so this is a balance to the last slide. So the, the last slide was about what happened in the spring. Now we're talking about what happens from now on. Um, so faculty and students are adapting. Uh, we can move from this emergency response mindset to a mindset of embracing our new constraints and trying to innovate within them. Uh, there is the possibility to have some really transformative experiences with your students, partially because nobody, uh, I shouldn't say nobody, partially because a lot of folks aren't expecting uh, the online environment to be transformative. So if we can create some experiences for our students that are engaging, exciting, where we make connections with them, um, not only will it surprise them, but it will serve them well moving forward um, because there are bound to be more situations in the future after they graduate 
where it would be very nice for our students not to be paralyzed by not being able to be in person with other folks. So they can also learn from you as a model and you can learn from them in terms of their context and how you can reach them. Um, it, you know, another part of this is as all of this has become the new normal, a lot of technology companies have updated their software or created new software that is um, providing supports uh, for online learning. So a lot of the tools that we had are incorporating more accessibility features um, and just more features in general. So we have to keep an eye on what's going on and make sure at the same time that we're only adopting the things that are really important in service of the teaching and learning. So it's a lot going on right now, um, but we're gonna try and help you through it a little bit here today. Um, there's another uh, uh, term called universal design for learning that some of you may have heard of. Really, it's a philosophy of trying to provide some options for students in terms of content assessment um, uh, to, to reach students of different learning abilities, uh, of students who prefer different learning uh, uh, content types and assessment types, and allowing them the flexibility to learn on their own terms. Um, what th this new normal is enabling is uh, a lot of faculty are now looking at universal design for learning as something that's important. And, and what's really important to know about that particular philosophy, if you're gonna look into it some more, is that it started as a way to accommodate students of different learning abilities, and it turns out it's good for everyone. So for instance, we're modeling that today, where we're doing this in a presentation mode, uh, presentation model, um, and we're presenting slides and all that kind of stuff but we also have a full on website that has everything that we're talking about today with even more resources. So if you prefer this in a text-based format, you have another way to revisit it in addition to the recording afterwards. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind, if you look at the slide, uh, all of you all as teachers are doing everything you can to prepare. Um, and it's important to remember from the student perspective that not only might they not be preparing as much as you, but they, not, they might not be able to prepare as much as you can because of socioeconomic status or context or environment. So it's really important in terms of UDL to design what you're doing so that students with different technological capabilities and different learning capabilities can still have a good experience and learn what you intend for them to learn um, as they're doing it. I also will point out that one of the people on my team uh, likes to point out in the slide that while the student is only using a cheap cell phone, they have a very nice music stand. So <laughs> if any of you else notice the nice music stand, you can identify with that perspective. The way that we're designing everything at Peabody is that we don't know what's coming. Um, I know a lot of schools, including um, Peabody, have put out some varying statements on what the situations are going to be in the fall whether we're gonna be in person, whether we're gonna be online. The truth is nobody really knows. Um, and we're, we're all planning for the best that we can plan for given the, certain, the current information, but nobody really knows what's gonna happen uh, towards the end of the summer. So what we're doing um, at Peabody is cre we've created a program this summer, a six week program for our faculty that over 55 of our faculty are participating in with us that uh, is a, basically a guide to flexible online learning or flexible course design, I'm sorry. Um, and that's the same name that you'll find on our website when we send you there. The idea is that regardless of where we end up, everything that we talk about in the presentation today is applicable. So whether you're in person, whether you're online, whether you're doing some mixture of the two, everything that we talk about can be applied to your um, traditional teaching model as well as your um, uh, new normal teaching model, which has been the normal for some of us for, for a little while now. Um, you know, McSweeney's is a, is a great satire site and um, they, they talk here about, you know, after careful deliberation, we are pleased to report we can finally announce that we plan to reopen campus this fall, but with limitations, unless we do not, depending on guidance, which we have not yet received. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard very similar language in some of your institutions or schools uh, messaging. Um, and again, the, the classic, if you have any questions not answered by this email, please do not hesitate to reread this email because we don't have any more information right now. So let's be prepared for as much as we can. A quick word about fully online courses versus remote hybrid courses. So when we do our course develop, our online course development process at Peabody, it's a six month process that varies from institution to institution. Some do three months, four months, six months. Um, but our expectation is that the faculty course developer that works with us works five to 10 hours a week over six months 
with a full instructional design team um, and we end up with a product that is buttoned up and polished and ready to go when the semester starts. You're not going to be able to do that and nobody is expecting you to do that. So what remote hybrid is, is we're talking about a model where you start to balance some of your live material with asynchronous material, which means uh, material in your learning management system, um, different types of learning content, different types of assessment, um, and you figure out what that balance is for you. And then the live portion of the hybrid will either be in a video conferencing tool or in person, depending on what's possible. Um, so it's, it's an important distinction because you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself that you're you need to have everything buttoned up and ready to go by the time the semester starts. Many faculty have full loads in the fall still um, and they have to get everything ready. So what we're working with our faculty on is why don't you get the first quarter of the semester ready of each of your courses. Get the first four weeks ready um, and get them polished up so you're ready to go and then work with your students over the course of that first month. Um, to figure out what's working well for them, what's working well for you. Um, be authentic in that moment. And, and that's where we'll find the most um, engaging experiences for the students as well. Um, and it's just a matter of being open to the, to the, the situation and being open to um, some progress with, in conjunction with your students. If you did want to dive deeper at some point, and we can only hope that some of you want to dive deeper on this stuff after we get through this presentation, um, this book that you see on the screen is one of the foundational um, texts uh, for learning online. Um, it's just got a wealth of stuff in it. So if you do want more information, that's a great place to look. So what's next? Um, what's important to remember is that this is not going to be a quick process for you. You're not going to watch one video or watch this one webinar and be a really good at remote teaching. Um, it's, there's, there's no good that's going to come from putting that pressure on yourself. Nobody expects that of you. Your students won't expect that of you. Um, and I think the earlier that we acknowledge that and try not to become experts immediately, the quicker we're going to become to come to a place of real growth um, and a place where we can really get into these new, these, these new environments and uh, play and figure out with our students what's going to work and what's not. This is a really great article that really sums up what you should focus on. Um, it's not the technology, right? It, it's, it's really the power of the connection in this moment. Um, you have to figure out how to connect with your students online the same way that you did in the traditional classroom. In some ways, some students, it's gonna go better for them in the online environment. It's gonna go better for you. So don't discount the possibility that there might be some things that you're not expecting that are really great that come out of this. Um, paying attention to the power of the moment we're in a really powerful moment right now for a number of different reasons and from a number of different angles. Acknowledging that and being in those moments with your students is important. As faculty or teachers, you may be the only source of continuity and solid presence for them. And making sure that you embrace that and encourage them to acknowledge that in the online environment is really important. Um, I don't think it can be stressed how important teachers are in the online environment. I know there are some things that float around about how Online education is really a way to start obviating the need for faculty. It could not be further from the truth. It's even more important to have engaging faculty who know how to reach their students and who know how to have discussions around important topics and content in an online environment that it's ever been. Um, and then this idea of being authentic and just being honest with your students, letting them be honest with you and creating the space for that to happen is where some of the really great experiences are gonna happen in the coming months. So get back to basics, um, use trusted sources. We talked about the fire hose. You need to look at the sources and who's giving you the information. Be discerning about that just the same way you are in your specialty areas when you hear about content. Um, this is a really great uh, strip from Calvin and Hobbes about how the dad is telling the sun that the sun rises and sets based on the temperature outside, um, which is just a perfect example of um, making sure that you vet your sources just like you would in any situation. Make sure you collaborate with each other. It's really important for faculty to talk to each other and find those spaces where you can figure out what each other's doing. I know there's some Facebook groups. We have some internal collaboration groups. Find those spaces in your institutions, in your schools, in your um, networking groups where you can all talk and figure out what's working the best way. Iteration we talked about already and we'll talk about more during this presentation. Um, if, if something doesn't work, don't abandon it, right? Try again, try and make it a little bit better. It's, this is gonna be an incremental process. It's not all gonna work right away. 
um, moving from emergency response to a place of innovation within the current context. It's real that messaging and that tone is really important. Um, it's really important that your students hear that, that you're excited and not just nervous, right? Um, so trying to communicate that whenever you can. And then using established models as foundations for what you do in this environment. So I talked earlier about the Addy model. I'm gonna hand this to Valerie in a second. The way that we have organized the tips in this presentation are by the steps of the Addy model, which is the Addy process, which is an iterative process, which means you go through it and then you loop back to the beginning. And those iterations can be four weeks, they can be two weeks, they can be a full semester, um, and they can, they can be a combination of those things depending on how you wanna use it. But the steps are analyze. So you look at what you want to teach and figure out how you're going to, what the, what you're going to do. Um, you design the course. So you design learning objectives, figure out what you're going to do. You develop, which means you build the course, you implement it, you deliver it to your students, and then you evaluate um, and you get feedback from your students. And then you take that feedback and you loop back to the beginning and you start over again and you just keep going around and around and around. It never ends and it should never end. If it ever ends, that means that you should pick a different profession because that means that you got too comfortable. There's always something to improve upon. So with that context and preface, I'm going to hand it to Valerie and she's going to go through each of those steps and give you tastes of all the different tips that we think are the most important and most valuable for somebody that's just coming into this. Valerie. Thank you, Joe. Let's get started with analysis. As Joe mentioned, that's where you're clarifying your instructional problem, looking at the learning environment and the needs of your learner. We're gonna begin with the end in mind. Uh, one of the foundations of course design is the backward design approach. Um, we're gonna identify the desired learning results, determine what you need to demonstrate mastery, and then plan every experience in the course to, uh, to be in service of those teaching goals. Next, you're gonna to wanna to organize your topics and have a course plan. If the content is well organized and consi with consistent due dates and workflows from week to week, students will be more able to focus on the learning and the community than the logistics. Online learners have to be more self-motivated. You wanna minimize the confusion and, um, and, and set that for them. Create clear expectations. Um, students should have no doubts what the learning outcomes are, what the assessments are, and how they'll be measured. Make sure your students know how to contact you and um, how they can find information in the course. Uh, yeah, let's, the design phase um, focuses more on the learning objectives, the assessments, the subject matter analysis, uh, the media. This is where you're planning. You want to make your course more welcome. This um, brief video out of uh, Educause talks about how to remove the psychological barriers that can get in the way of learning. What we're looking at is psychological barriers that students may face, certain groups of students may face when they come into the learning environment. Now we have 25 years of really good research on how these psychological threats or barriers function in face-to-face -face environments. Most famously, social identity threat, which um, most of the research, uh, which is essentially a fear of being able to perform as well as others based just on your group identity. So the most uh, research has been on females in STEM courses and African-American students feeling some sense of threat based on just their people group. mindful of the different cues that might communicate um, whether someone belonged in an environment. So everything from the image used on the course registration page or some of the first images that they see. Do they see people like them in that image? Or is it reinforced maybe the, the sense that, oh, I don't belong here because I'm not a, you know, for instance, uh, you know, in a CS course, I'm not a techie coder like those people. So think about the image, think about the text that, you know, that first experience, is this course for me? Is there a statement, for instance, about diversity and inclusion? So that would be the first thing. And there's lots of other cues in the environment that we that you could look at to say, you know, if I came into this environment as as a female in a STEM course, would I feel like I belong here? So the second 
thing that, that we would talk about is just different brief interventions. We call them interventions. They're just activities, right? That can be done to help forestall those feelings of non-belonging or forestall those feelings of psychological threat. So we call it a value relevance affirmation activity. Um, really simple to do. You can implement it with, you know, we use a Qualtrics survey where uh, it's each individual student just goes through it less than five minutes. They pick a number of values that are most important to them. Then they write about how taking this course will reinforce those values. And that has been shown to, you know, really persist over, uh, over an entire course to help someone feel like they can engage. It is a great video. We just wanted to give you a taste of the beginning. Um, I recommend you look into it um, when we move on. Um, one item uh, that you've probably heard in many arenas is chunk your content. Uh, this is true not just in uh, remote learning, but in all manners of communication. People are busy, people skim, people are constantly prioritizing the information they're consuming, you want to make it as consumable as possible. The longer anything is, the less likely it'll be consumed, and even more importantly, the less it will be retained. We want to work on uh, using your live sessions wisely. Synchronous learning is going to take place in real time with a group of learners, like in a traditional classroom or in a web conferencing session. Asynchronous learning is more learner-centered, where the learners complete their activities in their own time, regardless of their location. As much as possible, you want to strike a balance where you're building community and you have a two-way dialogue during your synchronous sessions um, so that you're really connecting with your students. The next item Joe alluded to in the beginning, balance curation uh, versus creation. Uh, getting information off the internet is like taking a drink of the fire hydrant. As faculty members, you're in a unique position to find the most reliable, accurate, and relevant sources that guide your students in a path towards your um, desired learning outcomes. When you're making a decision about creating or curating, incorporate your library resources. First, you're gonna to wanna to revisit your learning objectives and evaluate what you already have. Look for those gaps. Is curating possible? Then don't recreate it. Ask your librarians for help finding the best resources available through the subscription ser services, online education res resources, um, and all the other uh, tools that they have access to. And then prioritize building only that original content that helps connect the, the dots and pulls things together for your students. If I could just add something here. I know uh, whenever we talk, we work very closely with our librarians and our head librarian, Kathleen De Laurenti. Every time that we mention to her that faculty need help with something, um, every time she says, please just tell them to ask us for help. They don't need to know what they're asking, what they need to ask for. Just come to us so we can have a conversation with them. It's very similar to our process as instructional designers. And many times when we talk to faculty, they say, well, I guess I could talk to librarians, but I don't really know what they do. Um, so our, I guess our overarching advice for working with your librarians is don't worry about understanding what they do. But if you feel like you have some needs like what Valerie is putting on these slides, just reach out to them. They're, they are always very, very excited and helpful when people come to them asking for help with things like this. Absolutely, I think that's the message for all of us to use every resource you have available to, to deliver the best product you can. In the develop phase, you're, you're assembling your course, you're pulling all the pieces together. Some of these items you're already doing, we'll talk about bringing them into the uh, remote space. Uh, incorporate storytelling, pique your students' curiosity. Um, you wanna build connection, you wanna make meaning, you want it to be, uh, your information to be recalled. You do this in your traditional classrooms, you wanna make sure you save um, place for this in any kind of hybrid or remote environment. There's endless resources on these tools and we've uh, showcased quite a few for you. And just a note here that the storytelling could be over the course of one video or it could be a, a storytelling arc over the, over the duration of your course. So just keep in mind that, that all of these tips are flexible uh, on duration of application, things like that. Just think about how you can apply them in, in your courses. Absolutely. Uh, use your enterprise tools. Um, we all have our favorite tools for collaboration, communication, and conferencing. 
I'm sure your institution has gone through a comprehensive and inclusive process to determine the best one for your environment. Nothing's perfect, but it's really hard on the students if they have inconsistent experiences between the classes. You want to reduce their students' cognitive load, and you want to, again, use your resources. There's a whole support network designed to support those tools. It's less work for you. Explore your options when you're creating content. There's no shortage of, of tools to help package and bring information together from online infographic makers, animated videos, flowcharts and diagramming, and industry-specific tools. Uh, the resource on this uh, slide includes affordable resources for producers and uh, performers of, of musicians. Um, so don't, don't, don't be afraid to try something new. Dr. Wesh is an anthropologist who is contributing to this new video series. Um, the most important part, as just mentioned, is the people. Create authentic videos. It's hard. No one really wants to be on camera. Five reasons to get on camera is it humanizes your online class, builds relationships, it validates and motivates, it saves you time ultimately, and it makes your message very implicit. I encourage you to, um, to check out the series. If I could just add for a second, he does things that are really neat that are that are super simple. Like he does um, first person perspective videos and he'll take a piece of uh, 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 tape, uh, uh, a strong tape, and he'll put it on the back of his phone with a lip coming out of the back of it. Uh, and he does that so he can put the phone and bite onto it with his teeth and hold it like this while he's recording. The reason he does that is because then he can get first person perspective videos uh, when he travels. So he puts it in his teeth and gets the video and then puts audio over top of it later. He also shows how he does good uh, video. You can see the picture in the slide. His uh, camera for that video is actually his iPhone or Android phone, I forget which it is, but he's actually just taken the phone and taped it to a big picture window um, and taped his slides or taped his notes up to the window next to it. So you don't need expensive technology to get some of these videos done. He's literally using, I mean, the phone's a little bit expensive, but he's using tape um, and paper notes up on, the, up on the windows and just speaking to the camera uh, and, and looking out at his yard past his camera. So there are very simple techniques that you can use. Um, and we have lots of resources about these things on the website, um, all these different techniques that you can use that are, that are accessible at, at all different levels. Thanks, Joe. You want to embrace accessibility. Um, what we find is that it tends to benefit all students, not just students with special needs, but students in special environments or in special moods or um, having any kind of uh, disturbances in their context. Um, the current situation has elicited rapid evolution of accessibility features and existing tools. So check them out and look at your institution for the options that you have available to you. Move into the implementation phase. Um, this is where you're teaching the class. You want to use your LMS as a hub for learning. Um, you want to keep a consistent uh, learner experience as well as leverage the um, student enrollment uh, features. There we go. Uh, as always, you want to foster a consistent learning environment and keep the student experience at the front of your mind. The um, shift to remote learning works well for the learners who normally do well at our institutions, but not nearly so well for the already disadvantaged uh, students who have a more chaotic lives and need more support that can be delivered um, by a professor via Zoom, lectures, and email. It will drive inequalities. You want to prepare to do as much as you can to support all of your learners. Consider offering a variety of assignment options. Um, perhaps allow students to choose between written papers and video submissions where appropriate. Um, in addition to providing multiple ways for learners to demonstrate mastery, it'll cut down on the number of lousy papers you need to grade. Um, another item is um, the, there's a lot of different ways to teach. Knowledge is very social. It wants to connect. Um, teach what you know and have the students do something to teach back to other students. Let it be um, part of the communication. It provides some very interesting artifacts in the class. Provide practice opportunities. 
The resource on the screen provides close to 40 tips on how to practice um, uh, or doing more formative assessments. When it comes to figuring out what your students know, one piece of information just isn't going to give it to you, um, no matter how well designed it is. So I encourage you to think more about giving students indications of how well they're doing before they get to the big graded items. And last, you want to evaluate the, the course uh, and the students. Um, you want to incorporate student feedback. Don't wait until the end of the semester to gather student feedback. Work with your students a few weeks into the course, see how things are going, what the pain points are, and what could be better. And last, you're going to, as Joe mentioned, and I will reiterate, you're going to want to iterate, iterate, iterate. Don't get discouraged. Teaching online is hard, especially when it's new to you. Um, remember, if you're frustrated, you're learning just like your students. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not working. It just means you need to evaluate and try again. Um, you want to identify issues at the earliest possible stage and then work to bring it into your practice. We practice with our instruments. Um, you want to practice uh, with the teaching and the learning. We've uh, gathered a few comprehensive resources that are available. The Online Learning Consortium has published a uh, faculty faculty playbook on uh, transitioning to a remote or hybrid environment. FutureLearn and EDX um, have some time-based courses that you can look into but that address this topic. And of course, LinkedIn Learning is a video-based platform that you can work on asynchronously in your own time. If you'd like a more comprehensive approach, um, these will take deeper dives into many of the items we've talked about. So I also want to mention again, um, briefly, as we wrap up the presentation portion of the webinar, um, what we've set up at Peabody is something called the Peabody Digital Teaching Collective. And that's, as I mentioned, a six week engagement. We have almost 60 faculty that are going through that right now. Um, having built it, we've talked to a few different institutions that are really interested in what's incorporated into the collective. Um, it's essentially a, 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 a very thorough fleshing out of everything that's going on here in this presentation. So it's a, a, a strong balance of theory and practice um, that's really helping to prepare our faculty to get ready for the fall semester. We are considering um, creating different uh, time formats and um, availability of the collective. So if any of you on this call would be interested in something like that, of an instructor-led engagement, um, through a deeper dive on these topics um, and some more one-on-one -on -one time, we'd, be, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if it's either you or you think that a group of people at your institution would be interested, please email us at peabodyonline at jhu.edu um, and we're gonna collect all of those responses uh, and just uh, analyze it and see what the, wh how, much, how worth it would be for us to, to create something that's available um, to the, the community at large. Um, so we're really excited about that idea, but again, we would have to hear some interest to make sure that it's something worth pursuing. Um, so make sure to let us know, uh, and we're going to be gathering feedback from our faculty over the next few weeks. Uh, and we have it built right now, so the fir after the first two weeks, we get a lot of feedback and build that into the last four weeks of the engagement. Um, so we'll have a lot more information on, on all that uh, in the coming weeks as well. Finally, I want to leave you with this thought, which is... Uh, been incorporated throughout what we've been talking about. Um, Vanessa Denon has a really neat website where she has just a slew of resources about teaching in COVID-19. Um, but one of the most compelling uh, combination of words that she put on the site uh, are these six words. And I think it really encompasses everything that we're trying to get across in this presentation. People first, that includes you, that includes your students, that includes everybody trying to support you. Um, that's the most important part of all this, especially given the context that we're all in right now. Content is second. So once you take care of the people and the students and your, what you're trying to teach them, then look at your content and how your content and assessments um, and uh, learning content can serve the students uh, and your objectives. 
And finally, and always last, look at what technology you can implement. If you've started with the technology, you started with the wrong thing. So stay people focused and um, be easy on yourselves. Uh, and I think you'll find some successes throughout the coming semesters. Um, and I, I know that our faculty will. And we're just, again, we're just really happy to have had the opportunity to present some of this content to you. I, I, I did happen to see in the chat a few people asking about links. So if you go to peabody.jhu.edu slash keep teaching, there is a link on the right once you're on that page that's called the Faculty Guide to Flexible Online Learning. I guarantee you, you will find 98% of what we talked about in the presentation today. You'll find all the tips, you'll find all the links, you'll find excerpts from every link that uh, highlights why we think those links are important. So I encourage you to go to that website and look through that web page. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, and, and the recording, of course, will be available as well after the webinar is over. So thank you for giving us your time to present this. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Joe and Valerie, thank you so, so much. Um, your expertise in this area, along with the other members of your team, have been invaluable to us at the Peabody Institute over the last many months, weeks and months, both on the conservatory side as well as the preparatory side. Um, and so I, I wanted to give a special shout out to both of you and, and thank you in this forum as well for, for all of the work you've done supporting all of us across the conservatory in this crazy time of, of COVID-19. There are some questions that are coming into the Q&A, and so I'll, um, I'll, give, a, I'll give them a whirl if, if that's okay. Um, the, the first question, and there were a couple of these, I note, were really around ensembles and applied lessons. And um, any, any recommendations for transferring ensembles to online learning, learning or any combination of online and in-person? Um, I'll, I'll let you take that first. Sure. So uh, first, I know that uh, some of the recordings and some of the upcoming sessions in this webinar series uh, will tackle some of those challenges. Um, that wasn't specific to today's uh, uh, presentation, but I'm happy to address what we're doing at Peabody. Um, I know that we are trying to look at, how do I put this? So I know that our faculty are interested in, in synchronous performances. Um, that's kind of the holy grail right now. From an enterprise perspective, we're trying not to promise our students that because it takes a very specific set of technologies and circumstances to be able to achieve that. So what we're looking at is trying to support our faculty in things like stacked recordings, where uh, one student will record and pass it down the line and students will uh, uh, layer their performances on top of everybody else's and end up with a recording at the end. And that's really your aha moment. That's the performance is the package at the end. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the applied lessons, uh, we're trying to get better and better at using, so we use Zoom at Peabody. So we're trying to get better and better at figuring out what those settings are. I know that Yale is looking at um, submitting a, 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 a proposal from all of the music schools to Zoom to try and get them to put a music mode button in Zoom so that you don't have to go to four different settings to figure out how to do that. Uh, we're also looking at uh, assuming that it is a moment in time and we will get back to applied lessons in person sooner than later. Um, some of our faculty are looking at some alternate options for what to do uh, in the meantime. So whether that's looking at um, videos of other performances and analyzing them with their students or looking at sheet music and analyzing that with their students or any other of a number, any other combination of things. I know one thing that's really popular is um, considering having the students record and then submit the video and have use the live sessions for talking about the recording rather than for trying to do a live uh, interactive session. That can be helpful. There are also tools out there. Um, if you get to the point where you wanted to go down that um, uh, recorded video route, there are tools out there like VoiceThread. I know there are, another, uh, uh, there are a few other uh, tools like it where a student could submit a video of themselves to you. And then in, uh, at specific time codes, you can respond to them with video. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to see what they're doing and to talk to them um, at that moment in time. And they can see exactly which part of the video that you're talking about without too much effort. 
So I hope that's a, a, a good enough answer for now. Um, I know, that, like I said, I know we have a lot of other uh, sessions that are covering some of these topics as well. There will be an, um, an instrumental ensemble session on July 21st. Um, and there will be an applied study panel on uh, July 28th. You can register for either of those on the Peabody Keep Teaching site. So those are coming up. Um, there was a question in the, in the Q&A. Um, practicing is an issue for students in small confined environments or in a roommate situation. Do you have any resources to offer these students? So that's a tough one. And I, I think it's not limited to just roommates. I think it's limited to family situations. I think it's, you know, we have a dance program and I know our dance students don't have space in their houses to, to do dance performances. Um, so I think that it, it's, that one's a little bit more difficult because it is individual to the students. I think one thing that could be helpful is making sure that your students are supplied with technology that might help them. Um, some of the instruments that we have have digital options where they could use headphones um, and pipe the audio right into a Zoom call. Um, other than that, I think it's a matter of just helping the students to find spaces that they can do what they need to do. We can't, we, you know, we can't solve the challenge of instruments making noise, right? Um, so it, it, finding spaces is really the most important thing. I'm not sure there is a technological solution to figuring out how to, you know, play a saxophone and not bother somebody that's next to you if they would be bothered by that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is this one. When teaching online, do you find shorter time periods work better or should we keep the same allotted times for our classes? So this is a layered question. Valerie, I may throw it to you in a second, but let me just start. Um, one of the things that you have to be really careful of because we're all moving online and everything's flexible all of a sudden is that your institution, that you're paying attention to when your slots are that your institution is giving you because you have to keep in mind these students are still taking all of their other classes. So if every faculty just did their classes whenever it was convenient for them, they're gonna start overlapping and it's just gonna be a mess. So the first answer is stick to the times that you're given for your classes, even if you're not in person. That being said, there is nothing wrong and there's a lot to be said for moving some of your live classes to an asynchronous um, format. So Valerie, could you speak a little bit about that consideration of what pieces of your live class maybe you could consider putting into an asynchronous format and what you can reserve the live sessions for in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll start by addressing the time. Um, I'd leave that to in the student's choice. The student can decide how long they want to study and how, or, or work on school activities and if they need to take more frequent breaks. So building asynchronous activities gives the student more control um, and uh, it's more of a learner focused approach so they can choose when they engage in those activities. There's all kinds of um, activities you're probably already using such as readings or a video you might ask students to look at outside of class that they can do. They can do that on their own schedule, taking a break that is appropriate for them. What was the other part of your question, Joe? Or the what to reserve the live sessions for? Yeah, the live sessions, um, it's best to take advantage of the students and faculty being in the room together so that you can connect on the concepts and the um, more challenging um, items. So that timeline, again, honors the institution schedule and students are have that time blocked off on their calendar for you. So you would use that time mostly to connect and, and, and rather than a, and have two way conversations about the content. We've, we've had a lot of situations at Peabody where students are asking for faculty to open up the classes earlier than the time schedule and leaving them open afterwards just so they can be with their classmates. So keep that in mind as well is that you are kind of the conduit for them to be able to meet with each other sometimes and give them an excuse to meet, right? So um, don't discount the power that you have in, in maintaining the connections among your students, not just with you. Thanks, Joe and Valerie. And a related question, uh, someone asked, I'm scheduled to teach an online section of a course with time TBA. In other words, there's no set time. Should I expect students to meet synchronously, synchronously or should I plan the entire course to be asynchronous? So I think that it is never a bad idea to have a, a plenty of asynchronous content. Um, that being said, I think this, is a, this may be a simple instance of polling your students to see if you can find a common time. Maybe it's, you'll get lucky and there will be a common time. Um, some of the advice that I would give, depending on where your students are, is maybe to have two class sessions or two sets of office hours, one in the morning one day and one in the evening another day. 
So you don't have students that have to get up at four in the morning to meet with you, for instance. Um, that's, I mean, that's really it. I think it's, I think it's, you have to listen to your students and see what, see what they have available. Um, and then determine if they all can't meet at one time, if it's sufficient for most of them to meet at that time and the other ones to get the content asynchronously. But you do want to keep in mind equity as well. Um, so you do want to make sure if there is a difference between when and how people can meet that you're providing equal alternatives um, for the students so that nobody feels like they're getting less of a course or feels like they're being marginalized because they don't have something that the other students have. Okay. Another related asynchronous versus synchronous question in regard to chunking content. In my in-person Music of Prish course, I work up to watching a 30 plus minute symphony together, live video performance in class. Is that appropriate to still incorporate into an asynchronous online course or do you have a recommendation for how to do that? Again, it's working up to watching 30 plus minutes of sym symphonic music together in a live video performance in class. So I'm going to address the most important part, I think, of this, because some of this is, is just, yes, it's perfectly appropriate to do that. I think the, the technological challenge is watching a live video for 30 minutes with your students. Um, most of the experiences we've had with online video conferencing is that it is, it's become really good. But when you try and watch a video together, there are lots of different issues that you can come up that, that can come up between audio and video syncing, between students dropping out, between dropping out parts of the video and not following. Um, so unless you have a really good, unless you're going to stop the video and talk about it over and over again, if you just want to watch it together, what one option is to have everybody queue up the video on their own, in their own web browser and hit play at the same time um, and then keep a chat going during the video so that nobody has to pause the video and restart it, but you can all keep an ongoing conversation. I know at, at Hopkins, we use Microsoft Teams as a chat tool and a, um, uh, discussion threading tool um, that our students that seem to really resonate with our students um, and we're using heavily. So something like that where you have a chat going with all of your students while the video is playing might be a really neat way to do that where you're um, kind of circumventing some of the technological limitations. Valerie, is, is, that a, is that a complete answer? Do you want to, is there anything to address with the first part of that with leading up to the, the content? I think it just comes back to the objectives when you say scaffolding towards getting to a longer than if that's part of it, then I think Joe's solution sounds like a good way to make sure you're managing that environment and having the community continue and, and the dialogue along that process. Thank you. What recommendations do you have for assessments or types of testing or is there a good resource on this you could point us to? I'll start, Joe. Um, I, you'd want to make it as authentic and relevant as possible. If you can Google the answer in 30 seconds on the device you have next to you while taking the test, it's probably not the best assessment for an online environment. So you want to get more to the synthesis of information, the um, what they what they really know, short answers, um, short essays, something they're creating, some you know, a different way of working with it. Um, you can have them develop a podcast and then turn in a shorter you know, abbreviated reflection with citations. Um, you can, you, there are lots of options. Um, the key is to go back to what is the learning objective and how can they demonstrate mastery? There are usually a myriad of ways to demonstrate mastery of the content. Thank you. I, I would also just add that um, on the website, there is a, a formative assessment. There's seven smart, fast ways to do formative assessment on the website. Um, so I encourage you to go take a, a look at that as well, and that'll give you some other options for assessment. A, another perspective, because I also um, teach at the master's level, so I know some of the faculty perspective here. Um, while I know it is best practice to always do short answer and essays so that there's really that, that deep knowledge being conveyed, it can also add a lot of work to the faculty load of having to read through all that and mark it up. So part of the reason why videos are interesting as submissions is because you get to watch a video instead of reading all those papers, right? Um, and also it's good to balance. So there's nothing wrong with having some multiple choice tests or something like that if you balance it with some of the deeper um, assessment models. Um, just make sure if you do multiple choice that you do things like use your LMS to mix up the questions for every student just to uh, try and prevent them being able to share the exact test with other students. And you might want to think about putting a time limit on it as well. Valerie said you could Google some of those. A good way, a good cheap way to stop students from being able to Google every question is by not giving them time to Google every question. 
Thanks. There's a great question here about chunk length for information. So if creating a PowerPoint or video for information part of theory classes, how should they best or how should they be? What is the best chunk length for the information? And is there any thought as to whether PowerPoint or video is better? So I'll speak quickly about chunk length. So this is one of those things about drinking out of the fire hose. I watched a video uh, yesterday, actually, from a particular scholar who said that she would never make her videos longer than two or three minutes long. Uh, I think that's nuts. So you have to work, you have to think about what's, what works for you. That may work for her, but don't, if you see something like that, don't feel like you have to be in those constraints. I would not make an hour long video um, that the students have to watch. Uh, I often bring up the example of, you know, what types of videos do you watch that are an hour long? Uh, and often people will say, oh, I watch Game of Thrones or I watch something like that. I'm like, great, when you have the production value of Game <laughs> of Thrones and you have the acting capability of one of those people and an ensemble cast, make it an hour long. Um, but, you know, most of us don't have those talents and uh, can only be engaging on a screen for so long. Um, so you can you can make that better by by using some of the techniques on the website to make your videos better, but you can also keep engagement by keeping the videos short. It also makes your videos reusable. So if you keep the content if you keep the content topics short and the specific topics within each video, you can break up your presentations into topic 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 and just string them together. You can reuse those videos later in a different course because you just need the thing about music theory. So I'm going to grab that and I'm going to put it into my music history course because that'll just give me a good background over here. There's lots of good benefits to chunking this content up. But um, general practice, we do uh, at max 10 to 15 minutes is, is our standard within Peabody. But again, that can be flexible depending on your content and delivery. Thanks. Here's a question that keeps coming up at Peabody too. Any advice on how to get students to turn on video during live classes? It's hard to connect with them when they don't want to show their face. I can tackle that. Um, in our team, we established the norm on the first day that we were, we were home managing support calls, helping um, faculty transition. We're on, on screen. And during that first um, day, faculty says, it's so reassuring to see your face. They needed help. They want to know someone's there for them. It's the same with the students. Um, I think regardless of the age you're working with, you establish that norm at the beginning of the class. I think it's perfectly acceptable when there's bandwidth issues to try turning off the video, but there needs to be some kind of engagement and some kind of understanding on how to do that. Um, you don't go to class in pajamas. Uh, you're not, you know, eating lasagna, you know, in, in class. I think it's perfectly acceptable to establish those norms and be flexible when bandwidth issues arrive, but um, it, it I think it's really key to set that from the beginning. I would just add contextual issues as well. So bandwidth issues, but also in terms of the context of these students, um, you have to leave the opportunity that for some reason video is not viable for them in their environments. Um, and, and just in the interest of equity, you can't, you can't expect that everybody is com can be completely comfortable with what's going around behind them. Um, and extending that, if you work with younger students, like our preparatory does, we highly encourage them if they're in a bedroom or wherever they are to make sure the doors are open wherever their students are and make sure that other family members are present just so that all liability is removed from you as a faculty member were anything to happen on those calls. Joe and Christina, I fear we're out of time. Your presentation has been so remarkably helpful and, and the PowerPoint slides were so packed full of information. We're grateful to you that you, felt you will allow us to post those on the website. For all of you, the video for this presentation, as well as those slides, will be posted in the next couple of days on that Peabody Keep Teaching website. Again, a very special thank you to Joseph Montcalmo and Valerie Hartman, as well as Christina Manciora, Zane Forshee, Adam Scalici, and Patrick Wallen for their support today.